Hello everybody, welcome back to another brand new episode of Side Projects. This one is all about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, somewhere I have actually been, and I have actually made a video about this previously. It was a lot shorter, a little less in depth, so this is a sort of deep dive version. Uh, I will probably, nah, I probably won't, I'll probably forget. The vi original video might be linked below, <laughs> maybe, we'll see. Of all the engineering projects humanity has ever built, the one that means the most to people in non-engineering language is the bridge. Despite being relatively simple concepts, the fact that bridges connect people and places that are otherwise unreachable is some very powerful symbolism. Their very existence stands as a message of connection and coming together. Wow, I never, I mean, a bridge, it's like, yeah, from there to there. I'd never thought about it like that, but I guess that's because I'm a soulless hack. But what happens when they don't work? Bridges can fail in a number of ways, from structural deficiencies to natural disasters like earthquakes and tornadoes. But today, we have something very different for you. An example of a bridge that failed, not because of an earthquake, a tornado, or any kind of disaster. Instead, this bridge was felled by something far more simple. The wind. And not even a lot of wind, because you'd be like, well, isn't a tornado just a really a lot of wind, Simon? No, this was uh, a relatively small amount of wind. This is the story of the original Tacoma Narrows Bridge. The bridge that just blew over. The Puget Sound is one of the most interesting waterways on Earth. Its shape was carved out of glaciers in the last ice age, forming an almost labyrinth-like system of waterways that slide between the various stretches of land. But don't be fooled by how small they look in satellite photos. These waterways are huge. Though we could fascinate you with hours of details about everything from settlement to logging to Boeing to Starbucks to Boeing again to Amazon. Instead, what we'll do is focus on the fact that for now, there's a bit of land jutting into the sound called the Kitsap Peninsula, so named after Chief Kitsap of the indigenous Suquamish people, maybe? Side note here, copying names from American Indians is kind of a thing for the area. Seattle, for instance, is named after an Indian chief, Sial, maybe on the pronunciation, but we're digressing into a world of difficult pronunciations. The Kitsap Peninsula is rather sparsely populated, at least relative to the eastern side of the Puget Sound. Nonetheless, it is an important part of the area, being the location of both the city of Bremerton and a nearby United States Navy Yard. It was here that the geography of the Puget Sound worked against the Washington state government. If someone from, to pick a place completely at randomly, not really, Tacoma wanted to get to Bremerton by land, they had to go all the way around the Puget Sound to the south, then swing back up to the north where the Kitsap Peninsula connects with the mainland. I get the feeling that the solution to this might be a bridge. Such a big brain. This was a pain for local officials in Tacoma. The state government had boats to and from the areas, and indeed still does, in the form of a ferry service, but those take quite a bit of time to load and unload, especially for what's otherwise such a short distance. It's here that the first serious proposals for a bridge to the Kitsap Peninsula are found. <laughs> Several bridge architects were consulted, including Joseph B. Strauss, the designer of the Golden Gate Bridge. But there was one tiny, pesky little pernicious problem referred to as lack of funds. Proposals by city officials to pay for the bridge using tolls on roads and bridges weren't going to be nearly enough for the construction. On top of that, a private ferry company had a contract to utilize the narrows, the waterway that the bridge was going to cross, and the government would have to buy that contract out. In short, it was going to cost a whole lot of money. This made the cost benefits analysis rather unclear, but the Army and the Navy were all in on the project, managing both the aforementioned naval base in Bremerton and a couple of nearby forts. Note that apparently being all in in this instance doesn't actually mean helping to pay for it, so thanks a lot, guys. But the reality was that if they wanted it, they were going to get it, money troubles or no. An engineer named Clark Eldridge presented a conventional suspension bridge design, and the Washington Toll Bridge Authority requested $11 million, that's $185 million today, from the Federal Public Public Works Administration seemingly resigned to the fact that the bridge was going to hang off the budget like an albatross. But then came their savior, an engineer by the name of Leon Solomon 
Mosef, a bridge builder from New York who had also worked on the Golden Gate Bridge. That was a big bridge, lots of people worked on it. He and another man, Frederick Leinhardt, had published a paper that argued for a different engineering approach to bridge building, one that would require less resources than a conventional design. The details of these differences are complex and difficult to understand on a cursory reading, which is probably why, when Mosef petitioned the PayWA to build the bridge at a discount for almost half of the original price, they were just like, don't need any details, you're in, mate. Moisef got to work with construction starting in late September 1938, 19 months and $6.4 million later, that's $160 million today, the bridge was done, described by Moisef as the most beautiful bridge in the world. Because of course it'd say that, apparently he was a bit arrogant, but whatever. Everyone was happy. Moisef got a boost to his reputation, because it was Mwah, the most beautiful bridge ever. Tacoma residents got a bridge to Kitsap. Tacoma City officials didn't have to bankrupt themselves to pay for it. and the armed forces got their little pet project. Except for the fact that this new bridge, as it turns out, really didn't want to exist. The day the bridge opens on July the 1st, 1940, local residents noticed something when they crossed it for the first time. Whenever a mild wind hit the bridge, it would twist. Not in a vertigo sense, where it's still in your head, this movement was very, very noticeable. To the point where when the wind was strong enough, it would cause alternate halves of the bridge to rise up and fall four or five feet. That's not something that bridges are supposed to do. One resident said that the bridge would oscillate so much that the car in front of you would disappear, which is kind of terrifying. I would take the long way around. So be like, let's drive around. Simon, it's a four hour detour. We're driving around. According to Moisef's design philosophy, this was completely normal and was in keeping with the blueprints of the bridge. It was supposed to be flexible in the winds. It was supposed to be absolutely terrifying. The idea was the flexibility would stop it from breaking. The movements of the bridge had been known to its construction workers who nicknamed it Galloping Gertie and multiple modifications were made to the bridge to ensure that it could properly withstand any high winds so there was nothing to worry about. Spoiler alert, there was something to worry about. And worry those residents did, and the Toll Bridge Authority hired Professor Frederick Bert Farquharson, engineering professor at the University of Washington, to help them out. Farquharson performed some wind tunnel tests and eventually came up with a couple of solutions after the tests concluded on November the 2nd. The details of these tests and proposed solutions became a rather moot point, however, when just five days later the bridge stopped oscillating because it was gone. On the morning of November the 7th, 1940, a particularly strong winds began to blow in the narrows up to 40 miles per hour, 64 kilometers an hour. The bridge proceeded to start its usual wavy motions, but it was clear this time something was seriously wrong. A local journalist by the name of Leonard Coatsworth described the scene. Around me I could hear concrete creaking. I started back to the car to get the dog, but was thrown before I could reach it. The car itself began to slide from side to side on the roadway. I decided the bridge was breaking up, and my only hope was to get back to shore. On hands and knees, most of the time, I crawled 500 yards or more to the towers. That dog in Mr. Coatsworth's car, a cocker spaniel named Tubby, would be the only fatality of the bridge collapse. Professor Farquharson, who just happened to be near the bridge that day and a news photographer attempted to rescue him, but the dog was understandably terrified and bit one of them, forcing them to leave him behind. Tubby and the car were never recovered. Questions started being asked almost immediately. How did this bridge, which was rated to withstand 120 mile per hour winds, completely collapse at just 40 miles per hour? Moisef had no answer to give. He was as dumbfounded as anyone else. Even today, there's some conflicting information as to what actually happened with explanations like vortices and resonances and stuff like that. The answer is a complex one, but here is the officially accepted explanation. At the time of the Tacoma Narrows bridge being built, suspension bridges were still the relatively new engineering concept. Moisev came up with the idea that instead of using trusses on the sides of the deck, the bridge part of the bridge, he would use two solid metal plates running the entire length of the bridge. In short, the sides of the bridge had no holes in them to let wind through, which made the bridge catch the wind instead. This made the bridge vulnerable to a phenomenon known as aeroelastic flutter. To demonstrate this, imagine holding a piece of paper up to your face and then blowing on it lengthways. The edge will proceed to vibrate up and down. Scale that up a billion times or so or less, don't quote me on that, and you have basically what happens with the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. But whereas a piece of paper is light and thin and can sufficiently handle those vibrations, a bridge is a bridge, and it's gonna break. 
So what happened was the wind was striking the bridge, causing one side to go up and the other side to go down. But the bridge was so heavy and the wind so strong that when gravity pulled it back down, it went further than before and then the wind would push it in the opposite direction, which would make the resulting twist back upward even more violent than the first. Picture that same piece of paper from before. Now imagine that when you blow on it, the edge vibrates faster and faster until it just tears itself apart. And that is essentially what happened to the bridge. Eventually, after all that twisting around, something broke, most likely the suspension cables. The breaking of some cables likely increased the load on the remaining cables that had them broken, which caused them to snap as well. And then the bridge proceeded to fall 195 feet, that's 60 meters, into the Puget Sound below. And I've stood on this bridge, it's a lot, I mean, I've stood on the bridge that replaced it. It's a long way down. Although the collapse of the bridge was a very obvious embarrassment for everyone involved in its construction, <laughs> no idea why. How did this happen? Says the bridge designer. This may be one of the few instances where the silver lining outweighs the losses. In the aftermath of the bridge, extensive research was done on the causes and the physics involved. The results of their research would go on to influence future long span bridge designs, making them more or less windproof. It also served to broaden our understanding of aeroelastic flutter, which was good because that's the thing that used to affect the wings of passenger aircraft. Also, a terrifying prospect, as was flying in the past, generally. Scary and dangerous. Just imagine you're on a plane and the wing just starts shaking itself apart. I apologize if you've downloaded this in the airport terminal and are watching this on a plane. <laughs> Even for Leon Moisef, whose reputation would be tarnished by the collapse, the disaster proved a chance for him to get something out of it. He would dedicate the last few years of his life to an exhaustive study of everything that went wrong before dying of a heart attack in 1943. He would not live long enough to see the bridge rebuilt, which still stands today, but even with this failure under his belt, the Moisef Award would be created later that decade to recognize supreme contributors to the field of civil engineering. It just goes to show that failure... oh. It's but a stepping stone to success. What a beautiful way to end this video about the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This has been an episode of Side Projects. If you loved it, smash that like button. If you didn't, there is a dislike button. And as always, thank you for watching.